I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our gospel this morning recounts two appearances of Jesus to his disciples after the resurrection. In the first, Jesus appears to the disciples the night of Easter day, and he breathes on them who are gathered in that room, telling them to receive the Holy Spirit and giving them the authority to forgive sins. The second appearance, though, is focused on Thomas, although the others were there as well. But Thomas was absent that first time that Jesus appears. And because at first he does not believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead, when Jesus shows up that second time, he invites Thomas to actually touch his wounds. He sticks his fingers, Thomas sticks his fingers in the wounds of Jesus, in the place where the nails went through his hand, and where the spear pierced his side, which it just blows my mind. But the physicality and even the intimacy is important here, because Jesus was not some ghost who appeared to the disciples. He was, he is, flesh and blood. Our belief, our belief is not some spiritual thing or some symbolic resurrection, or the resurrection of merely the soul without the body. We believe in flesh and blood, in a God who became human, who died in excruciating death, and then came back to life. Yes, changed in some ways, certainly, but still a real, eating, breathing, physical life. And this has really important implications. A flesh and blood resurrection means that our bodies matter and that this earth matters. What we do matters because when Jesus was raised from the dead, God was declaring his intention to raise all things from the dead, to transform the world, to transform all reality, to reconcile everything to God. Because of the physical resurrection of Jesus, we are invited to participate in God's transformation of all creation. So what we do with our bodies matter. How we treat this planet matters. What we do with our trash matters because of the resurrection. How we care for the soil and for the trees and for all the life that has been entrusted to us to care for, all of that matters a lot. In short, because of the resurrection, matter matters. I find it pretty hard, personally, to get excited about our popular culture's idea of heaven. You know, disembodied spirits floating on clouds and playing imaginary harps really doesn't sound like how I want to spend 10 minutes, much less all eternity. But a God who transforms, who is through us, transforming everything through the power of the resurrection, now that is something to get excited about. And it seems that Thomas gets chided here in this gospel passage, you know, for being doubting Thomas. Sorry, Thomas. But if we remember the entire story, the other disciples in the room are not off the hook, are they? The other disciples didn't believe right away either. They all needed evidence. The resurrection was so unexpected, so unbelievable, that Mary Magdalene did not recognize Jesus even when she saw him for the first time in the garden. When Mary later tells the rest of the apostles that she has seen the Lord, none of them believed her right away. They all needed to see for themselves. And we get that weird story of, of the apostle John and the apostle Peter having a foot race to see who gets to the empty tomb first. And so when Jesus, in the passage we read today, when Jesus says, blessed are those who have come to believe even though 
they have not seen. He isn't talking about any one of his original believers who are in the story. So who is he talking about? The Gospel of John was written for the edification of second and third generation believers, people who did not witness the resurrection firsthand. And as those first generation believers were dying toward the end of the first century, that's when our Gospels were being written down to preserve that witness, that testimony. And so Jesus was talking about second, third, fourth generation Christians. In other words, Jesus is talking about us. He's talking about generation after generation after generation of Christians. He's talking about us to us. We are followers of Christ who are not eyewitnesses of the resurrection, and yet we believe the testimony of the apostles, which has been passed down to us through Scripture and through an unbroken line of bishops, which extends from the first disciples all the way to Bishop Daniel. You can count the bishops. You can trace the line of succession. And so the resurrection is not something that can be proven in the modern scientific sense. It is not a repeat, it's not repeatable in a laboratory, right? According to the dictates of the scientific method. But we all base our lives every day on unproven facts. There's no other way to live. I couldn't prove beyond a doubt that the sun would come up this morning. It is not repeatable in a laboratory. And yet I trusted it would, just like it has every day since the world began. There are lots of things, most things, that I cannot personally verify, and so I trust others. I trust my neighbors. I trust many, many people who make up the common fabric of our lives, often invisibly. You ever thought about how much you trust your garbage man? I trust scientists and researchers and others who've devoted their lives to exploring some section of this vast cosmic truth that is our universe. We all place enormous amounts of trust in people and in things that we do not control and that we cannot verify because there really is no other way to live than to trust. And that trust is the crux of the matter. Jesus, in this passage, talks about belief. Believe these things. And we use words like belief. The danger for us is that we understand it to be just mere mental assent. It's a very cerebral, cognitive sort of belief. We weigh the evidence in our minds. We, you know, synapses fire. And yes, we believe. But that's not it. That's not what Jesus is talking about. It's not the kind of belief that our passage speaks of. When he says, Do not doubt, Thomas, but believe. The original language there carries a much deeper connotation than mere mental assent. Perhaps a better way to render that into modern English is the word trust. Don't be untrusting, Thomas, but believe, but trust. Belief on the purely cognitive level means very little. It requires of us very little, but trust requires commitment. Belief happens when we weigh evidence and the firing of synapses and all of that, but trust is belief in action. Trust is always relational. It always involves a relationship. In fact, trust is the glue that holds all relationships together. It's not enough to rationally believe in your spouse or in your partner, is it? To believe that your spouse exists, that is not enough. It's not enough to weigh the evidence and to make a determination in your head. For a marriage to be healthy, each partner must trust each other. Trust is the will to bind your life to another. And so when we are asked to believe in the risen Lord, in the resurrected Christ, we are being asked to trust Him, 
to will, to bind our lives to His, to His life, because He is life. The unique thing about trusting Jesus is that it can't be done alone, though. And perhaps, really, the only reason to fault Thomas in the story, the reason he really got in trouble, and that differentiates himself from the rest of the disciples, is not that he wanted to see Jesus and to touch his wounds. Perhaps it is that he wasn't in the room the first time that Jesus showed up. Now, he probably had a good excuse that we're not told in the Gospel of John. John says there's lots of things that he didn't write down, right? But he was apparently off doing his own thing, and he missed being in the presence of the resurrected Christ. So Thomas couldn't trust in the risen Lord by himself, off doing his own thing, and neither can we. We need to work out this resurrection business together in community with each other, with all members of the body of Christ. Because the same trust that binds our life to Christ binds us all to each other. That is what baptism is about. Being bound together in the waters of baptism, we are crucified with Christ, and together we shall rise again with Him. Together, not just by ourselves, individually, but together with all Christians in all places, in all times. That, too, is what the Eucharist is about, eating the body of Christ together in order to become the body of Christ together. Together, in the power of God, we can transform the world. And every Sunday and every other time we gather, it is an invitation to trust. It is an invitation to to take ever more seriously the audacious and mysterious claims of the physical resurrection of Jesus. And blessed, truly blessed are we who have not seen, yet have come, have gathered here to believe, to trust, and to be transformed. Amen.